Hello and good evening to this episode of ESR Connect, focusing on COVID-19. And in this uh, session, we will focus on the collaboration between radiologists and radiographers in fighting COVID-19. And it is a great pleasure for me that this is a, a webinar, which is a, a collaboration between the European Society of Radiology and the European Federation of Radiographer Societies. Uh, with me today are again, three very prominent speakers uh, who will cover important topics in this field. And we will have a talk given by Professor Lukas Ebner from the University in Bern. He will talk about imaging findings in COVID-19. This will be followed by a talk by Nick Woznica from London. He is a PhD uh, radiographer, and he will talk about the, the uh, departmental planning and radiographer interpretation. And last but not least, Marino Zanardo from Milano We'll talk about lessons learned from the pandemic. Also, he's a PhD and a radiographer. So there are exciting uh, talks we are, we are gonna hear. My name is Helmut Bosch. I'm a, a radiologist here from the Medical University in Vienna. And now I would like to ask my, ask my colleagues here to introduce themselves. Lucas, would you like to start off? Well, uh, thank you very much, Helmut, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. My name is Lukas Ebner and I'm a thoracic radiologist at the University Hospital in Bern, Switzerland. Nick, would you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Helmut. Thank you, Lukas. Hello, uh, my name is Nick Woznitzer. I'm a radiographer in London at Homerton Hospital and Canterbury Christchurch University. And last but not least, the micro is yours, Marino. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Moreno Zanardo, and I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at Policlinico San Donato in Milan. And uh, I am a radiographer and also the treasurer for the Italian Federation of Scientific Radiographer Societies. So I didn't promise you too much. They are really exciting speakers, and the topics are really, really interesting for all of us. Uh, before we get started, I would like to remind you that this is a very interactive uh, webinar, so you can send in your questions using the uh, chat function and send in as many questions as you have. We will address them at least as much as we can, uh, pending the time. And we will start off with the, the first talk given by Professor Ebner on the imaging findings in COVID-19. Lucas. Thank you so much, Helmut. I will start off with uh, reviewing some characteristic imaging findings uh, we see in COVID-19. And also I will try to briefly touch on the role of imaging uh, in the overall triage uh, of patients and the patient management from our local perspective. I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. So, um, in general, the use of imaging is somewhat heterogeneous. There has been some controversial discussion whether to use uh, primarily CT or conventional radiographs. And uh, there is some debate going on. And I won't focus so much uh, on what modality to use. I think this is highly dependent on the local healthcare directives you're following and the local resources, also your uh, point of care management when it comes to patients. Each modality has its values. And in brief, we know that CT has shown to be a very sensitive tool. In particular, when you look at cases that present at very early stages of COVID-19, those are patients with no or mild symptoms. And uh, we've seen in, in very early studies in the pandemic that CT is proven to be a sensitive tool. On the other hand, you have just radiographs just radiographs um, are not so much sensitive to these very early findings. However, 
depending on your local strategy, when you ask patients to present with moderate or more advanced or even severe symptoms, uh, their sensitivity, sensitivity increases substantially. I think it's important to know that uh, imaging is not a standalone test, also in the, in the COVID-19 setting. And it's more like a puzzle stone within uh, the diagnostic workup of those patients. And this is just a brief glimpse on how we do the triage on our COVID track in our hospital. And you see, we do a clinical assessment with uh, oxygen saturation, breathing frequency. There is also extensive lab work, blood urine samples taken. We also check for other uh, viral infectious agents, such as RSV virus, influenza, and we do a COVID swap, of course, and we have established, luckily, a fast track now with turnaround times of a couple of hours. And one of the puzzle stones is imaging, uh, be it uh, radiographs or computed tomography for depicting the extent of disease in the lung. The main goal here we follow is we want to identify patients that are in need for hospital care and, and admission and that need, need to go uh, under isolation or even ventilation versus identifying patients that can be safely uh, sent to ambulatory care and self-isolation and quarantine at home. As I mentioned, both modalities have their value. We know from chest CT that it's very sensitive, especially in early findings, and it's superior when it comes to imaging the complications of COVID-19 and foremost, of course, pulmonary embolism, which is increasingly being recognized as a common complication in those patients. On the downside, there are the logistics required if you do CT scans. I think only a few departments might have a dedicated COVID scanner or have even uh, CT scanners on the isolation ward or ICU. Basically, you have to transfer patients to the CT suite, which can be a route of transmission in those patients. Also, you might face limited capacities and resources as well. And finally, important uh, point is that you have to calculate with uh, scanner downtimes mostly owed to decontamination. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the chest radiographs, which are fast and widely available. There are even mobile uh, radiography units that can be deployed anywhere in the hospital, emergency room, intermediate care, intensive care facilities. And I think Moreno will touch on this also in his talk. And you have a compared lower maintenance. However, from the diagnostic point of view, we have to consider that it's less sensitive in early findings. And of course, if you want to image for complications like pulmonary embolism, chest CT is the way to go. I'm moving forward to the most uh, typical findings or characteristic findings in COVID-19 on radiographs. And uh, you see here on the left, there is an image showing ground class opacities, more pronounced in the right lower lobe, more in the lung periphery. And uh, this has been described as an, quite an early finding. Those can be subtle and difficult to diagnose on the radiographs. However, if you start imaging later on in the course of disease, like in the middle image, you see that there are more pronounced peripheral dense consolidations ill-defined with ground class opacities. There is a predominance of the peripheral and subplural lung zones, and also you see more mid and lower lung portions affected. Another finding that has been described in the literature is that multiple lobes are affected, as you can see in the case on the right-hand side with extensive patchy uh, opacifications in both lungs, left and right, with ground class mid and lower lung zones. So those is those are some typical findings we see in patients that present with COVID-19. Moving to the chest CT findings in COVID-19, it basically shows you the same as on the radiographs, but with uh, higher sensitivity. On the left, you see a case of a patient presenting with no symptoms, and the CT nicely shows you those peripheral ground glass areas in the lower lung zones. Subplural location, this case was also confirmed as having COVID-19 afterwards. 
when you move on in the timeline and you do the imaging probably a little bit later in the course of disease, you see more of those patchy consolidations, also peripheral and subpleural in location. And you also see some mixed uh, ground class opacity within uh, those areas in the lower lobes. Also, you might see here in this case, in the middle lobe, there are those perilobular consolidations, patch-like and some like more arcade-like uh, consolidations. And those we would describe as areas of organizing pneumonia, which has been described in COVID-19. In the image on the right-hand side, you see a patient with crazy paving pattern. The crazy paving pattern is defined as areas of ground class attenuation with inter- and intralobular septal thickening here in the upper lobes. Typically, it has been described that uh, COVID-19 cases do not exhibit pleural effusions or lymphadenopathy. If you use CT in more advanced cases, from my experience, especially if patients suffer from acute respiratory distress syndrome, or they have superinfection and uh, pneumonia, then you might find some pleural effusions, usually moderate, so don't be surprised. <clears throat> and of course, an important complication I mentioned earlier is pulmonary embolism. This is the main of CT, and this is increasingly recognized as an important complication in COVID-19 patients. Now I move on, I want to share a couple of cases with you. We see them almost on a daily basis. Uh, this is a patient presenting with dyspnea and cough. The patient had no fever at presentation. However, the oxygen saturation was considerably low. And uh, on the top left, you see the initial radiograph. And this is somewhat an odd mini finding in COVID-19 patients. You see those patchy opacities consolidations. There is uh, some ground class mainly in the lung periphery and with the predilection of the mid and lower lung lobes. So this is something we would report as infiltrates that could indicate COVID-19 pneumonia. In this patient, we see a follow-up. The patient developed acute respiratory distress syndrome and septic shock. There was a super infection with staph aureus. This is also depicted in the CT scan on the bottom left. Here you see those dense low bar consolidations with air bronchogram and diffuse ground class opacities. What was pretty remarkable in this patient was that there was a fa relatively fast clearing of those infiltrations in the lungs, as you can see on the radiograph follow up on day 10. Here's uh, a patient. 67 years old with advanced findings in COVID-19. And the patient reported that he was in close contact with a individual that was tested COVID-19 positive. And the patient felt kind of sick for at least five days, cough and oxygenation was low. And here you see a more diffuse pattern of pulmonary infiltrate, somewhat asymmetric in the right lung, but also predominantly patchy consolidations and ground class. And this was also uh, confirmed COVID-19 by PCR. We do that regularly. So all patients undergo testing with PCR. And you see during the course of disease, patient required mechanical ventilation and those infiltrates are quite persistent. There's a last case I wanna share with you. Uh, this is a 64-year-old patient who reported to have fever for five days. There was a syncope for unclear reason, and he's presenting to the COVID track with otherwise no symptoms. And what you can see here is that there are very faint peripheral patchy ground class opacities, especially in the right lung. And I think it's relatively difficult to appreciate on these images. They look more impressive on the workstation. However, this was reported eventually positive for COVID-19, and this was confirmed by PCR testing. And what you can see here on the follow-up is on day five, the patient, uh, the patient condition worsened 
there was a decrease in O2 saturation. And we did another X-ray now showing the more typical appearance with bilateral peripheral patchy consolidations, ground class in a mid and lower lobe lung predilection. And unfortunately also this patient required mechanical ventilation. And you see on the CT image on the far right, the extensive amounts of ground glass and consolidation, mainly in the lower lobe, but diffuse ground glass there. And this brings me almost to the end of my presentation. Um, probably two resources I found really helpful are the consensus statement by the ESR and ST, also the consensus statement by the Fleischner Society. Also, many publishers made their COVID-19 related research open access to browse. And finally, I wanna draw your attention to the Eurorad database, also supported by the ESR, housing a huge collection of COVID cases to familiarize yourself with the findings. Thank you so much. Uh, stay healthy and Helmut, back to you. Yeah, Lucas, thank you very much for this beautiful overview on imaging findings in COVID-19. We already got a number of questions and I would like to invite all of you to send in more questions as these experts are now really happy to take your questions. We'll focus now in the, after this uh, first presentation more on imaging findings and the management will be discussed later after the other um, presentations as well. Lucas, uh, one question which came in and uh, is really important. You mentioned the CT has a major role in patient management, but what would be the indication for you to send a patient to CT? Because the problem we have is we you need to, to transport the patient. You have to you have to the, the, uh, to the disinfect or to clean the CT. So that's quite a, a uh, task to do. So what are the indications? Do you have any st strict uh, indications or are you relatively flexible here? Um, so first I have to say in, in this kind of situation where we're all dealing with something not fully understood yet. We have to all be flexible to some degree. Uh, but of course, we have certain um, guidelines and SOPs we follow. Uh, mainly, it's it depends on uh, if this is an outpatient presenting on the COVID track uh, and if there are any complications suspected. For instance, patient has really uh, bad overall status, desaturations and probable comorbidities, uh, those patients might require CT scans right away. Also, in these cases, if the patient has to be administered to ICU and prior to intubation, we use a presumptive CT diagnosis of COVID-19 for these patients for uh, screening, as you will. The other case is when patients are already at the hospital and uh, are on isolation or ICU, then it depends. So um, the monitoring is primarily done clinically. If there is for any reason an unexplained deterioration of the patient or there is suspicion for PE, we do CT scans. Otherwise we follow uh, via radiography. So imaging is the workhorse and imaging is still uh, chest radiograph, chest radiograph, isn't it? When it comes to the number of Not only it, it depends. Uh, okay. Yeah, we see more radiographs than CT, yeah. Yeah, and how often do you perform repeat uh, imaging? On a daily basis on intensive care? No, we usually don't do that. Um, this all depends on the overall clinical status. Um, if there is no substantial change, we don't do imaging. Um, only in case, for example, as we do with all our ICU patients, if patients get a new uh, line installed or ECMO or intubation, we do control chest X-rays, but also for other reasons, complications like pneumothorax, for example, or effusion, or if there is severe congestion. Otherwise, we don't do serial radiographs uh, in COVID-19 patients, just for monitoring infiltration. And do you use standard report forms in COVID-19 patients in CT as well as in chest radiographs? Um, yeah, especially when it comes to the overall impression, 
to give some sort of guidance and also some evidence level from our side uh, and confidence level, of course. Um, what we do is we report if, for instance, in, in the setting of COVID track, so patient has some sort of a pretest probability that is higher than usual, we say, okay, patient has a positive radiograph, meaning there is some sort of infiltration or not. And then we further stratify if this would be like a characteristic image we see in COVID-19 equivocal or favor another diagnosis. So this is somewhat our standardized reporting. Okay. And this is and also transferred coming... to CT. Okay. And then there's a question coming in in regard to what you see in the follow-up chest radiographs, I assume. Uh, do you see an increase in the density and extent of opacities over the first few days? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends, of course, but assuming that uh, serial radiographs are taken in patients that have been hospitalized for COVID-19 and um, the indication for the radiograph was uh, that there is in any case, way worsening patient condition, I expect an increase in infiltrations, yes. Okay, then there's another question uh, in regard to the protocol you, you are using on the CT. Is it always a CTPA, a, a pulmonary angiography, or do you need to use uh, non-contrast enhanced CT scans? Yeah, this also kind of depends. Um, from my experience, when uh, the pandemic started and in the early phase, uh, we did more non-contrast scans simply for checking the infiltrates and uh, give an estimation of the disease extent. But uh, now that our procedures also get more refined, um, I realized that we do more and more CTPE studies because this is one of the main uh, reasons uh, we get referrals to CT to exclude CTP uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. Yeah. Yeah. There's one question we mentioned that there, there's a problem that you have to transport patients to the CT. Uh, is there an option to bring the CT scanner, a mobile CT scanner, to the patient? So the critical thing is we don't have a mobile CT scanner. So um, <laughs> could be, <laughs> yes. In, interestingly, um, I had conversations with uh, representatives from China and they have their own, in, in, in the huge centers, at least uh, dedicated uh, ICU scanners or scanners on the isolation ward, minimizing the route of transmission. Yeah, but there's, uh, then there's the other problem that you have the substantial uh, amount of radiation. We should you have to shield, and at least in our center, the intensive care would be not of be equipped to do that. I think in your center it would be the same. No need. I think we yeah. we move on to the next presentation. There are more questions, which then are I will address to all of you in uh, later on. Nick, would you be so kind to give your presentations presentation? Thank thank you, Helmut. Um, as I said, so my name is Nick. I'm a radiographer in London, and I'll be looking through how departments can start planning the post-pandemic, but also exploring the role of the radiographer in the pathway. The British Society of Thoracic Imaging have been very engaged and very proactive within the COVID crisis, recognising the key role that imaging, and in particular chest imaging, is playing as this pandemic unfolds was made to help guide both clinicians, radiographers and radiologists about the best use of, a, of, of imaging. And as Helmut was uh, indicated during the introduction, the chest X-ray is really the workhorse of imaging within COVID-19. Mobile radiography is proving essential, both because patients are critically unwell, but also, as Lucas mentioned, trying to minimise that transmission risk to patients and to staff. Radiographers are really finding themselves at the front line in managing this pandemic. Considerations as departments start moving from uh, sort of pandemic to post-pandemic phase, the prevalence of COVID-19 is fortunately decreasing 
maybe not as quickly as we would like or we would hope. But just from my recent clinical experience, we're starting to see uh, normal chest X-rays again, which is is nice to see, but also non-pathology. I think one of the things is is that we need to think about how we begin our sort of our business as usual, our normal healthcare, how we can return some services. It needs to be phased. I think one of the critical things I read uh, last night was that are we reinstating or are we reinventing healthcare? Should we use this reset to actually look at what we do, how we do it, and the optimal pathways? But it will need to be phased and we'll need to protect staff and patients and make sure that we maintain sufficient capacity in case there is another wave. As patients, as, as we move to outpatient imaging and cancer screening services, we will need again to look at patients at first attendance that may have symptoms in keeping with COVID-19. During the pandemic, I think it was assumed that everybody presenting to a hospital was a potential patient, but we'll need to look again at the first point of contact, which is often the radiology reception uh, staff, to look to make sure that they don't have any worrying symptoms. This could also be done during pre-triage telephone call prior to appointment. Some of the systems of work that we've implemented during the pandemic, such as increased staffing to cover mobile imaging, the use of digital radiography mobiles and digital radiography in general wherever possible to minimize uh, transmission and radiographer workload, but also dual working where you can try and have a uh, patient contact and an indirect contact to both reduce work, uh, the intensity of the work, but also decontamination of equipment. And a thing that I'd never really considered as part of an infection control process working as a radiographer was adequate air exchange in when you're bringing the patient to the equipment, such as CT and MRI, as COVID-19, as we know, is spread through droplets. Things to consider as we reintroduce uh, non-critical imaging is, is it possible to stream into suspected and non-suspected COVID areas where possible? Uh, Lucas mentioned the use of dedicated scanners. Um, my institution only has one CT scanner, so we're going to have to think about how we do it. Uh, mobile scanners in the sense of not, to, not within the hospital, but relocatable scanners that may be available to be um, implemented alongside the normal static units. The other thing we need to think about is scheduling. If we are asking patients and the public to maintain social distancing outside of a hospital, we can't go back to overcrowded waiting rooms. And the implication that this will have on imaging activity and scheduling CT, MR, ultrasound. Uh, my institution hasn't had a booked X-ray appointment for years, but how do we start managing the patient flow and the activity within the department? One approach proposed in England, which is gaining some traction, is a regional approach to use uh, pool resources within the regional of the NHS. So within England, we have a national health service. Do you start looking at using different hospital sites, which may or may not be used for suspected or unsuspected cases? Moving on to the second aspect of my talk, which is radiographer image interpretation. Um, for sort of for background, I'm a reporting radiographer, which means I've undertaken extensive postgraduate training and I report chest X-rays, skeletal X-rays and neonatal X-rays. So this is an area that's both my clinical practice and my research. Radiographers are generally the first healthcare practitioner to see any diagnostic imaging. They're at the front line with the patient and the image. It's essential as we move our post pandemic into recovery for radiographers to be able to identify and triage imaging suspicious for COVID-19 for an immediate report. This is especially uh, of interest in cases where imaging is performed other than for the investigation or evaluation of COVID-19. Uh, examples are lung bases on CT abdomen, um, chest x-rays done for other reasons. We need to make sure that radiographers are supported with appropriate education to identify red flag findings. 
to make sure that the patients have appropriate treatment, management, infection control around the reduced transmission risk, especially given the well-documented cases of asymptomatic spread, to, to identify cases for a fast-tracked, preferably immediate radiology report while the patient is still in the department, and then the appropriate level of equipment determination. One possible imaging workflow is to stratify symptoms triage at time of referral, at time of presentation to the imaging department, and then within a suspected COVID stream, appropriate radiographer PPE, which will be covered by Moreno in the next talk, dual working and equipment decamination. For non-suspected COVID-19, appropriate PPE as well, but also the radiographer interpretation of the initial findings, not a report, but a triage decision based on suspected or unsuspected and an appropriate radiologist review if required. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really interesting and also comforting to see that we all struggle with the same problems nowadays. Uh, and one of these problems nowadays is how to get back to the uh, to what we had before and how can we get back there. So how long do you think it will take us to, to, to go back to normal, considering that we are still living in this uncertainty that we don't know if there's a second wave coming or the prevalence mm. is still quite high. So uh, where do you see us now in, 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 in months from now? Oh, uh, that million dollar question. Um, yeah. I, th I, th I, think, I don't think, it, nobody knows. I think there's some growing evidence, which is actually saying that delayed diagnosis and death from other causes is a significant factor. I think we need to, as I said during my talk, we don't need to reinstate services. We need to reimagine services. Most places now have no waiting, no reports. Everything's been put on hold. So is this the opportunity to actually take a clean slate, a fresh piece of paper and start designing imaging investigations the way that we would ideally, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, how would we design a service? How would imaging fit in a patient pathway rather than just automatically the reflex of we need to do everything the same that we've always done? So I, I, I don't think timing can be, um, can be guessed. But I would like to, you know, out of adversity comes opportunity. And I think that should be, that's my message. I really love that view. That this is also a an opportunity for us to improve uh, for the future. Uh, there are a couple of questions now. Uh, what do you mean by dual red work? Could you just go back briefly to that? Yes. And I think Moreno will sp touch on it recently is, um, is using two radiographers to perform imaging and examinations for cases of suspected or confirmed COVID-19. This allows one radiographer to position the patient and another radiographer to position the imaging equipment, often a mobile X-ray unit. It uh, allows efficient working. It hopefully reduces cross-contamination, although obviously you're using hand washing and PPE, but it also reduces the physical burden on the radiographer, having two radiographers performing a mobile chest X-ray, which can be uh, at times challenging and physical. Okay, uh, and then how do you train your radiogra radiographers? You mentioned that the radiographers are the first one to see images, and if they see something which looks like or could be COVID-19, they should alert the radiologist. So how do you train your radiographers? Okay, so I uh, trained in Australia um, uh, 20 years ago, um, and even then the basics of image interpretation of it was, was covered in the undergraduate training program. And I recognize that worldwide, in Australia, in the UK, in Europe, there's different levels of the different levels of image interpretation training at undergraduate level. I think postgraduate or in post, once radiographers are qualified and practitioners, it's very much a collaboration between the radiologists, the senior radiographers, and the radiographers. The e-learning for health uh, organization in the UK has fantastic resources which have been made on image interpretation for radiographers and other healthcare professionals um, that have been made free to access during the COVID-19 pandemic. And how do you train your personnel in, in your hospital? 
Uh, in my reference? hospital, uh, so for image interpretation, the radiographers have blended uh, support from radiologists who provide the very the the high level um, uh, essential findings. We have the e-learning program, which I mentioned, and then it's also it's just it's time with people that report. So we have our uh, radiographers come in on our reporting sessions as well. And is this triage you mentioned now becoming becoming less important or even more important that we are now moving in a in a time when we don't see that many cases? I would my opinion is that it's more important. In a pandemic scenario, um, it's assumed that everybody has it and everyone is it, or might not everybody, that lots of people have it. I think the pre-pandemic and the post-pandemic phases are where the radiographer triage really comes into its own. Asymptomatic, trans asymptomatic transmission is one of the routes of spread. And if people have incidental findings, that's when the radiographer triage will really add value because it will make sure patients have appropriate management, that transmission risk is reduced, and that the report can be provided as soon as possible. Okay, then there's a, another question in regard to asymptomatic patients, which is a real problem we are struggling with in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you are uh, streaming your patients into suspected and non-suspected, but there will be mm -hmm. a number of non-suspected cases which then prove to be positive. How do you trace them and how do you make sure that the risk is as low as possible? Uh, that, that, again, that's a million dollar question and one that uh, not only healthcare workers, but governments are grappling with worldwide, some more effective than others. We are in a position where radiographers are using PPE for all examinations. And but you, for confirmed cases, suspected cases, or those with NSL ger generating procedures, they're using a different level of PPE, which is covered, I think, when Moreno up next. I think it's really challenging. It's a, a disease that nobody's seen before that seems to be spread asymptomatically or with mild symptoms. I wish I had the answer, but unfortunately, I don't. I'm sorry that you don't have the answer. <laughs> I would like to get yeah. <laughs> because we are struggling in the same thing. Okay, yeah. I think we move on now to Moreno's talk and then we have uh, again time for discussion. Moreno, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. So I will be glad to present my personal experience on uh, how regular workflow can be maintained in COVID-19 pandemic and uh, how to keep up precautions uh, in a post-acute pandemic setting. Finally, I will report on our experience on the use of mobile equipment in relevance to providing healthcare in different settings. So, um, okay, so uh, COVID-19 is continuing its spread uh, across the world uh, with uh, over, uh, okay, perfect. So uh, with uh, more than uh, 5 million confirmed cases uh, and more than uh, 3,000 people uh, that have lost their lives. So the true number of cases is thought to be much higher than that reported, as many of those uh, with uh, milder or no symptoms have uh, not been tested and as a consequence uh, uh, counted. So um, Italy has been uh, under lockdown uh, since the 8th of March and uh, all clinical and routine uh, activities uh, were suspended, except for chest X-ray and uh, CT and uh, for emergency procedure. Moreover, new restricted and limited areas were created in the hospital and uh, due to a limited availability of uh, PPE resources uh, at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, it was vital to adopt the necessary precautions in order to avoid uh, further spread of the virus. At the beginning, uh, the shortage of uh, PPE uh, was leaving radiologists, radiographers, nurses, and uh, other frontline workers dangerously ill-equipped. And starting from this week, the last Monday, with the so-called uh, phase two, and the clinical activities uh, restarted uh, and so uh, did the screening programs. Uh, this led to organizational issues, and we recently calculated that due to the breast scanner 
uh, breast screening uh, uh, cancer suspension in Italy, 1.2 million of uh, missed mammograms must be uh, rescheduled. So a reorganization of screening programs should be taken into account. And uh, for the back to usual practice, I have no idea when we will uh, return to our normal situation. In fact, uh, we will probably have to get out our patient uh, used to reconsider the hospital as a safe place uh, and uh, to always participate, uh, for example, in uh, screening programs. So next slide. Yes, perfect. Uh, the most important points uh, from uh, Italian COVID-19 experience uh, uh, was that we published on Radiography Journal uh, was that the uh, we divided uh, the hospitals uh, between uh, uh, COVID-dedicated structures uh, or specialized hospital. Moreover, we dedicated uh, isolated room uh, for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients. Moreover, we separated the staff into multiple shifting, uh, multiple shifts uh, to minimize the risk that staff uh, uh, will become uh, as a means of uh, transmission. It's uh, very important, uh, uh, the act of uh, disinfection, decontamination, or more simply to cleaning uh, the equipment. And uh, it's very important to perform it uh, with the use of uh, appropriate technique according to Hospital Infectious uh, uh, Disease Control Committee uh, between every single patient. So we published the T's and other advice on the um, the recently article published on radiography. And um, the scientific committee and the societies that are a part of uh, FASTER, uh, the Italian Federation of Radiographer Societies, published a recommendation on different topics, not only on the management of uh, chest X-ray and CT, but also in uh, MRI setting, in nuclear medicine department, and uh, recently in uh, breast imaging. So uh, at our institution, we ensured that uh, all appropriate PPE was available for staff and that uh, the staff were trained in the safe use of PPE based on uh, our local risk assessment and the national and international guidelines. Moreover, we created a specific space uh, for COVID-19 uh, suspected or confirmed patients and we split uh, staffing into multiple shifts to limit the exposure, the expo uh, the exposure of the entire team. Um, I think let's move to the second part of uh, my presentation, how we trained radiographers. So um, we were involved in an international uh, group and together with uh, more than 40 contributors, from uh, around the world, we published uh, different materials that can be assessed and it's available at this link. And uh, the ESRRT, in partnership with the European Federation of Radiographer Societies, have developed uh, e-learning resources on COVID-19 for all radiographers. So I think it's very useful uh, materials. Moreover, uh, we shared uh, the documents published by the World Health Organization on how to wear PPE and some uh, interesting and funny video on uh, how to correctly wear and remove, uh, for example, a surgical mask and all other PPE. In this slide, you can see an example of uh, a photo of one of our radiographers before acquiring a chest X-ray of uh, a COVID patient. Uh, secondly, we organized a little working group to define the best way, the best acquisition protocols for radiological exams, uh, such as uh, X-ray, chest X-ray or CT. And the most important points were uh, to preferably work uh, in pairs using uh, uh, the same scenario that described uh, correctly Nick before. Uh, so the dirty and the clean uh, radiographer scenario obviously always wear PPE correctly and uh, to schedule patients uh, uh, time slot in order to dedicate a specific time for cleaning the equipment and uh, to uh, eye cleaning. 
It may also be crucial to focus on uh, health workers' mental health in order to prevent uh, burnout. Uh, mental health is uh, essential, particularly during these uh, difficult times. Uh, so as a worsening mental or emotional state can impact on uh, every aspect of our lives, uh, including work. So we distribute uh, a pamphlet with suggestion, indication, and with uh, practical examples on how to prevent burnout with uh, exercise that you have to do every day. So, and uh, moreover, we share the phone number for free psychological support. Finally, every week we tested uh, all healthcare workers, uh, including radiographers, using uh, anonymous uh, surveys and to detect potential stress related uh, to work. So let's move uh, on the last uh, uh, section. Uh, we proposed uh, a model on how to bring radiology at the patient's home, especially uh, expecting for the future new, new waves of the pandemic. And um, OK, so we recently submitted a brief communication uh, on the role of the domiciliary radiography as a new weapon against uh, uh, this pandemic. And um, we wish to propose a model that could be useful in this setting, relying on a team composed by a radiographer and a nurse that uh, directly at the home of the patient or in a nursing home to perform chest X-ray and secondly, a nasopharyngeal swab. In this model, uh, the referring radiologist immediately reports the examination and the team that is still at the patient home uh, can eventually provide support uh, to the patients and their families concerning what to do and how to properly conduct uh, home isolation in case of uh, positive findings. So I think uh, uh, in conclusion, it's very important to focus on these uh, three aspects that you can see in the slide. Obviously, always uh, adopt the most indicated PPE in every single case, and to promote a mobile X-ray approach at the home of the patients or in the nursing homes. And uh, finally, to take into consideration to prevent uh, burnout, especially for uh, radiographers and all uh, health workers uh, involved uh, as a frontline healthcare. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moreno. A really important questions you you raised here and topics you raised. Um, you said uh, you mentioned in your talk that in Italy there are more than one million missed mammograms, uh, which now have to be rescheduled. How do you plan to, to do that in your, at your institution? OK, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, my institution is a cardiovascular hospital and has become became a COVID-19 hospital for about two months since um, the, the beginning of March. But now we hope to recover. So we started uh, to come back to a normal diagnostic work from the last Monday, but uh, at only 30% of the power. So I think that we have to reconsider that a new solution should be found. Probably we will extend the time dedicated to screening program, or we, we, we must work on Saturday. I don't know if the patients uh, uh, can. and. Uh, we must recover the exam gradually so and progressively, so not not tomorrow, so in the next months. Thank you very much. And as expected, there are questions coming in in regard to this uh, mobile x-rays you are performing at home. How often do you do that? And uh, can you a little bit describe your experience in this regard? OK, yes, I would like to share our experience of uh, my colleague in Bergamo, the center of the Italian outbreak, our colleague performed, I think, more than 500 chest X-ray in nursing homes or at patients' house. And uh, at the beginning, the nursing homes uh, were not considered as a safe place. So 
uh, after the general practitioner prescription, the radiographer acquires uh, the chest X-ray and uh, it is uh, seen by the radiologist in charge, I think in one hour or, or less. And uh, we should consider that the appropriate effective radiation dose administered by the modern integrated digital X-ray mobile units is very low. So it's uh, quite similar to that acquired in a radiology department. So, and uh, moreover, uh, the overall cost of uh, this approach uh, should be lower than that, including all the processes. So bring the patient uh, from the house to the radiology department. So I think it's cheaper. And uh, I think this approach could be very useful, especially to reduce the contamination and the stress for the patient. And in regard to shielding, I assume that you are performing this in normal households. There's no shielding for radiation. Uh, is there any, did they, did they change regulations to allow for that or is it that the radiation dose so low? I think it's very low the, in the effective radiation dose, but uh, if you consider the recent statement uh, published by the American Physicist uh, Association on uh, what we should shielding and not, uh, I think they uh, describe that it's not mandatory to shield, especially in this case, because uh, uh, the lead apron could be a source of contamination and uh, so it's not ad advisable to, to shield the patients in this case. And then uh, there are questions in regard to the uh, PPEs. Uh, is it allowed to, to reuse PPEs and uh, the N95 masks? How is it done in Italy? At the beginning, uh, with the shortage radiographers and all uh, um, healthcare workers, so, um, no, I think that uh, now we are in a, we can use uh, uh, every, I think, three or four hours a surgical mask and uh, we can change it uh, every, uh, I don't know how many patients. Okay. Uh, is it necessary for the radiographers to wear PPEs all the time now or do you have also patients where you don't use it? That's a question from the office here. Okay, so I, I think I don't have the answer, uh, but I think uh, it's very suggested to use uh, uh, always the uh, at least the surgical mask. Uh, I think in a, um, a daily work on a screening program, so uh, you don't know if the patient is uh, uh, asymptomatic or suspected, or uh, you don't know. So it's advisable to use always the, the PP, in my opinion. I don't know, probably in the future you can uh, use it, but. I think in, at least in Austria, you have to wear a mask when you're entering a shop. So I think it's quite advisable to wear it also if you have a, a regard yes. to a patient. So that's, I think, yes. pretty sure. Um, next question coming in. Uh, this is really important uh, a topic you raised, the mental health issue. How do you monitor how, mental health? Uh, do you have any special programs to do that? And what do you do if a, patient, if a uh, radiographer shows signs of stress? Okay, so uh, we discussed it with a psychological society expert in this field. And the suggestions were to perform um, physical activity and uh, to take a break also during uh, the shift and to spend time uh, on your own hobbies or to pick up a new one. And last but not least, uh, uh, be supportive uh, of others, especially with your colleague. In fact, they may be feeling similar emotions uh, to you as uh, the situation is uh, uh, so different to normal life. So. Uh, my suggestion is to help uh, if you see a colleague that uh, could uh, be in a burnout syndrome or uh, it's very stressed, uh, you should talk with him. And uh, I think it could be a very uh, useful for the radiographer's team. Uh, 
Nick, do you have any special program in, in your country, in your hospital, in this regard? So I've uh, had two experiences. I back in my host hospital, but I also spent a few weeks at the Nightingale Field Hospital um, in London at the field hospital in the uh, conference center. And staff psychological well-being is paramount um, at the induction for the field hospital site. They had a, was called a psychological PPE. So working with consultant clinical psychologists uh, and experienced healthcare practitioners, recognizing that this is a very abnormal environment. This is the first time many of us have seen or experienced things like this. Um, and uh, it's front of mind. So, you know, the, the as you put on your PPE, you ask your colleague, how are you? And sort of, and with the, the, do, the doffing as well, um, there's support, as Moreno said, with psychological services, with employee well-being programs, and also acknowledging adequate rest breaks, both between shifts and then uh, away from the hospital completely. And to share one of my personal opinions, I think it's also important for us to take care of the clerks because they have less medical training and they have quite a lot of concerns. And I think their medical, their mental health should also be of our concern. We should at least guide them in the right direction. Um, okay, then uh, there's a question to uh, Lucas again. Uh, the colleague who asked first the question in regard to the um, uh, consolidations specified this question a little bit more. He asked that uh, there's, uh, there are reports indicating that if there's an increase in the extent of consolidation after six, uh, after seven to 10 days, this might have a worse prognostic uh, implication or indicate a super infection. Do you perform routine chest radiographs or other imaging uh, imaging uh, modalities after seven to eight days? Lucas, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now we do. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so basically we don't do routine imaging follow-up studies. Um, not after seven days or 10 days, it really depends on the overall patient condition. Um, of course, if you see an increase in uh, consolidations or pulmonary infiltrations, this might be some indicator that uh, the overall pulmonary infection is getting worse. Um, you can do a quantification of that and just, um, I think it was last week, there was a new study published in radiology where they did a semi-quantitative assessment of pulmonary infiltrates on chest radiographs using just a stepwise approach in six lung zones. And this apparently showed some good correlation with overall patient outcome. Um, but when it comes to the indication for imaging, uh, we do radiographs only if there is some clinical concern worsening patient overall status. And the same applies for CT if there is suspected pulmonary embolism or um, some super infection, we might do a CT scan. Does this answer your question? I hope so. <laughs> I didn't ask it. I just gave yeah, it forward. <laughs> um, the next question is to you again. Do you have any personal experience or opinion on the use of ultrasound in COVID-19 patients? So I personally, I don't have an experience with ultrasound in COVID-19. There are reports that uh, it might have some value as a bedside test, for example, especially when you think about this uh, typical image in COVID-19 where the lung periphery, the subpleural areas are mainly affected. Uh, I can imagine that uh, a lung ultrasound has some merit in this scenario. In our department, uh, we mainly do radiographs and uh, not ultrasound. Thank you. Uh, Moreno, there was apparently an issue with the uh, uh, live session now in re uh, when you answered the question on the reuse of PPEs. Could you briefly repeat the, your answer here? On the reuse of PPE? Yeah. yeah uh, okay. So, uh, 
uh, at the beginning uh, of the pandemic, uh, uh, we was mandatory to reuse the surgical mask, for example, or um, for one day along. But now uh, in Italy, we have a, a situation with a lot of quantity of uh, PPE. So I think it's very important to change uh, uh, the PPE uh, when you have to change. So if you if the PPE is uh, contaminated or if, uh, if you touch something that uh, probably uh, could be contaminated. So uh, every time you think that uh, you need to change the PPE, you have to do it. And last but not least, a question to Nick. Uh, which barriers do you see departments needing to overcome to introduce non-critical imaging and screening services? Thank you. Um, I think part of the barrier is patient confidence in attending hospitals, as Moreno identified. Mm. There's uh, increasing evidence from the United Kingdom that not only are we seeing decreased attendances for uh, non-urgent um, conditions. We're also seeing lower attendances in the emergency department for myocardial infarcts and appendicitis, amongst other things. So I think ensuring that the patients are confident that they that the hospital is again, as Moreno said, a place of safety. That we make sure that as we introduce services, we keep that front and foremost. We make yeah, we ensure that yeah, we, as I said, we use this as an opportunity to reset and to reimagine how we deliver imaging. Thank you very much. I thank you all of you. This is a really great session. I learned a lot here and it's also comforting if you see that all of us also others struggle with the same problems you, you are struggling with. So again, thank you very much. And thank you to the audience. There, was, there were a number of questions. I summed up most of them and I thank you for answering all of the questions and for this great discussion. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.